With a new interpretation coming up of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings worlds, I, looking back at Peter Jackson's films and looking at the new version coming out on Amazon Prime of, the, of that universe, of that world, I'm asking myself, are they using the right kinds of weapons for the environment that they're actually fighting in? Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatorian. Now, let's start at the beginning with Peter Jackson's films. First of all, these were, of course, an interpretation of The Fellowship of the Ring and so on and so forth. And there is some disparity in the arms and armour shown in those movies compared to what's described in the books. I've always had the impression that in the original Hobbit and Fellowship of the Ring, Return of the King, everything else books, we see a sort of technology which is more akin to the Anglo-Saxon Viking era, migration era, Frankish worlds. So predominantly armour is is going to be uh, certain types of mail, aka chainmail shirts. Predominantly, people are going to use swords, shields, spears, bows. However, when we look at Peter Jackson's rendition, and indeed the new Amazon Prime version, we see arms and armour that is hundreds of years further forward in development, if we compare it to the real world. We see plate armour, we see long swords, uh, various types of pole arms that don't appear really until the late medieval or renaissance periods. And is this actually correct for the sort of world that we're expected to see these heroes armed in and surviving in? Apart from the fact that we have issues with goblin arrows going through Gondor plate armour, which of course, what's the point of plate armour if it doesn't stop most arrows? Additionally, we've also got the question of, is a longsword the right type of sword for Aragorn or Gandalf or various other heroes who are using longswords to be armed with? Or indeed, a lot of the time we see people using one-handed swords by themselves with no accompanying weapons, no bigger weapons. Usually shields aren't shown. I've been a big critic of the fact that we don't see Boromir using his shield very much, despite the fact that we know it exists. And indeed, uh, if we look at the Riders of Rohan, we see shields on their horses and yet they charge into battle with lances and swords and with the shields hanging off their horses. They're not actually shown using them very much. There are some occasions when we sh see shields being used. We see the uruk using shields. We see Eowyn using a shield. So that's good. However, one-handed swords historically throughout most of the medieval period were used in conjunction with shields. That's partly what makes sense. For the people who aren't using shields, and why aren't they using shields, they tend to be using long swords. Does this make any sense in a world where the predominant enemies are things like orcs and goblins? So what I want to address here is what should be the primary weapons, even if we assume that the technology level is at a kind of 14th, 15th, 16th century level, minus guns, um, what sorts of weapons should be used by the humans, the elves, the dwarves, in their wars against the orcs and the goblins. Now, weapons and armor, of course, are partly about offense, but they're also about defense. And you know what's also about defense? That is using a VPN. And here we've got NordVPN, who are the sponsors of this video. I bet that loads of you are already using NordVPN, but if you're not, then you need to check out my link below, which is nordvpn.com slash scholargladiatoria. It's absolutely risk-free and can give you greater freedom. It can give you greater security, give you peace of mind and help you secure your data. You can stop the all-seeing eye of Sauron being able to see exactly what you're doing on the internet. Nord can put your internet activity behind a next generation wall of encryption. And much like the riders of Rohad, NordVPN servers are ultra fast. So you don't have to choose between security and speed. Thanks to the hundreds of secure person-to-person -person servers, you can transfer data, massive files like I often have to do yourself. You can choose the quick connect option or you can connect to servers all around the world. What that means is you can bypass geographic limitations on your internet access. You know, a fantastic example is that my kids love the Despicable Me movies and Minions, so do I actually, um, and they disappeared off Netflix, uh, which was a real bummer for me, but with a VPN I can get them back. Connecting to Japan. That's right, connect through Japan and you can get Despicable Me and Despicable Me 2 back on Netflix. So you need to check out nordvpn.com slash scholargladiatoria, link also below right now. It's absolutely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. So now let's get back to the main topic of this video, looking at are the weapons that we see portrayed in Peter Jackson's um, films and indeed in the upcoming Amazon Prime series, 
are they the right kind of weapons for the situation? Well, before we answer that question, let's ask, what is the situation? So I'm going to simplify it somewhat. Now, I know it can be a lot more complex than this, but then it could just become an extremely huge spiraling uh, topic that is impossible to answer. So fundamentally, what's the technology available? Well, let's say the technology available is 15th century, maybe 14th century minus firearms. Now, I know that the gunpowder debatably exists. However, firearms don't really exist as far as we know in the, uh, at least the Lord of the Rings settings that we're used to seeing on screen. So we're talking about medieval weapons and late medieval armor. Okay, now that obviously the armor available does dictate the weapons available. That's the first piece of context. The se second piece of context is who are the weapons being used against? Well, they're not only being used against people like orcs and goblins, and I'll come back to those in a minute. You've got to remember that there are multiple other creatures. There are huge uh, monstrous creatures. Um, there's dragon type things, although they're not very common. There's other types of large creatures. There's even um, things like, you know, uh, tree ants and stuff. Whether you're going to fight them with conventional weapons or not, I think it's dubious. You're going to probably use fire, for example. But for the most part, most of the people who you're likely to fight are either going to be um, orcs and goblins, or they're going to be other humans, elves, dwarves, halflings, people like this. So essentially they are humanoid. So yes, indeed, giant creatures exist. And I do think that for fighting against giant creatures, there are going to be specialized weapons, uh, perhaps even machinery, siege engines to some extent. Uh, but for the most part, the standard hand-to-hand -hand weapons or missile weapons that are going to be used are for fighting other humans, enemy groups of humans, or, or elves, or dwarves, or halflings, or orcs, or goblins, and all of these are approximately humanoid in size, and roughly humanoid, uh, humanoid in constitution. Although, this is, the, this is the elephant in the room, so to speak, the, the orcs and goblins have a lot of variation. Now, Urukai, for example, are a very specific type of opponent, and they are super, super tough. So you can think of them as super strong, super tough, super high stamina, humans, humanoids. Um, elves equally are very dexterous and probably quite strong compared to a typical human. Um, and then, of course, there are other groups of humanoids who are tougher and stronger and faster than typical humans that we might be used to. Does that make an enormous difference to the type of weapons that might be used? I kind of don't think so. Although what we might see, for example, are swords, typical swords. If we just take an arming sword, for example, we might find that depending on the users of them, if we are looking at people who are stronger than a typical human in our world, uh, and perhaps more de dexterous as well, then we might see weapons which are actually slightly bigger, slightly heavier, um, perhaps slightly longer. So for example, rapiers in our world are pretty long type of sword, but we might find that um, elves, for example, if they were using rapiers, might use particularly long bladed rapiers because they're able to manage them. Or indeed, dwarves, who are very strong, you might find that their axes, and in fact we do find this basically, don't we, in, in the uh, kind of artistic renditions of Viking axes, hammers and warhammers, things like that, tend to be bigger than a typical human axe. So when we regard a Dane axe as one of the biggest types of axe that might be typically used in medieval history, we might find that um, uh, dwarven axes are bigger, thicker, therefore heavier, because the dwarves can handle them. But equally, they are, of course, shorter, so they'll have shorter shafts. So there are individual physical capabilities, whether it's in dexterity, height, stature, strength, that dictate the sh shape and size of the weapons. But fundamentally, we wouldn't necessarily see completely different types of weapons. So the thing that I kind of come around to thinking is that what this question is actually about is in a world inhabited by hordes of dwarves, um, hordes of um, orcs and goblins, would you necessarily choose these types of typical weapons that we saw in medieval Europe? So I think the basic answer is yes, you would see the same approximate range of medieval weapons, although slightly as mentioned in slightly different weights and statures and sizes because of the different uh, physical abilities of the different people using them. But 
I think that different weapon sets would be preferred or less preferred based on who you were and what you were doing. What do I mean by that? Well, if you were a, a citizen of Gondor and uh, you, you weren't at war and you were going about your normally normal daily business, you were equivalent of a knight or uh, a merchant or whatever, or indeed Rohan or anything like that, then indeed I think we'd see very, very similar armament to medieval Europe because it's a similar situation. However, as soon as you're at war with a group of people, say for example, orcs and goblins, then that entirely changes things because now you're fighting against hordes of humanoids who have quite different physical um, stature and abilities and tendencies and ways of fighting to humans or elves. So quite simply, a longsword, if we look at uh, Aragorn or Strider for example, a longsword walking around in the wilderness expecting to run into goblins, a longsword with minimal armour might seem like a pretty bad choice because a lot of the time when you fight you are going to be outnumbered. How often are you going to encounter one single goblin and have a duel with them? Mm. As far as I can tell, not very often. Most likely, you're going to end up running into a group of goblins. Now, is a longsword a good weapon for fighting against a group of goblins? I won't say it's a terrible weapon. However, there are probably better options. I would argue that a better option would be a sword and a shield, for example. Okay, so if I grab a, even a buckler, um, so a, sword, a shield or a buckler, and bucklers can be carried pretty conveniently if you don't carry a large shield. I'd say a large shield's better because what do goblins often do? They often shoot arrows at you, um, and a shield, of course, can protect you against missiles in a way that a sword and buckler can't do so effectively, and certainly a sword by itself can't do it very effectively um, because the shield not only provides an active defense but also a passive defense by just being there. But but nevertheless, a sword and buckler or a sword and shield I think are going to be much better against fighting against multiple opponents. And in fact, if we look at the real historical world, indeed, sword and buckler, we see it in European treatises, how to fight multiple opponents. You can even hold a dagger in the buckler hand at the same time. And if we go to India, for example, we can see multiple opponent training there. Or even paired swords. A pair of swords are quite good. I don't have another arming sword here, but let's use a mace instead. Paired weapons, one in each hand, is a way of fighting multiple opponents. The other option for fighting multiple opponents would be a pole arm or something longer. Okay, so indeed, a Dane axe, much, much better at engaging people at long range. What do goblins often have? Spears, so you don't want to be at a huge reach advantage, which you are going to be at with a longsword. Yes, you can fight multiple opponents with a longsword, but if they're shooting missiles at you, if they're using pole weapons like spears, it's really, really suboptimal. A better option than a longsword would be a big Zweihander or Montante, okay, so a massive two-handed sword. Yeah, you could absolutely mow through swathes of goblins with one of these, or with the Danax, or a halberd, or something like that. So, I would say that a longsword in particular is a particularly, especially out of armour, is a particularly bad choice for facing large groups of orcs and goblins, whether you were travelling or whether you were in war, doesn't really make a difference. The only exception I'd make is if you are in armour. Now, if you are in armour, you're more impervious to missile weapons, you're more impervious to incidental pokes from a spear, things like this. So perhaps if you were wearing quite complete plate armour, or even head to foot mail for that matter with a great helm, for example, then maybe you could get away with using a long sword um, a little bit more uh, effectively. But travelling around in armour, you can't usually wear armour all the time. So contrary to whatever video games you've played or role playing games you've played, the fact is that plate armour is somewhat uncomfortable and inconvenient to wear. There are examples from history, for example the Agincourt campaign, when people were specifically told to keep their armour on for a prolonged period of time because action was imminent at any point. That is unusual. However, it comes at huge drawbacks. It makes doing all sorts of things very difficult, even sleeping difficult. Certainly things like crossing rivers or climbing over things difficult. Um, and, you know, it's just generally unpleasant. So. Armour is not normally kept on all the time, so therefore if you're not wearing full armour, I think a longsword is a bad choice for most people. Um, if it doesn't have other things, you know, if it's not, for example, a backup to a spear, 
or a bow. Now, let's just talk about Aragorn's other armament here, which is a bow. Um, now, bows I think are pretty good. Obviously, you're using them predominantly for hunting and for gathering food. But defensive terms, yes, if you are a good archer and you've got a pretty good um, high rate of fire, then indeed they're fairly effective against a large group of approaching enemies. And really, if we're dealing with a, um, a, a fighting a numerous enemy, so enemy who are pretty much always outnumbering you or the group that you're in, then rate of fire is king. And so I think it is important to point out that bows in this kind of world building context are vastly more effective than crossbows. Crossbows have their own virtues, you know, they can be kept loaded, um, they can be used more effectively through windows or doorways um, in fortifications, they're more accurate, um, This and they're potentially more powerful in some situations. Um, so they have all sorts of advantages, crossbows, but in this particular scenario, fighting against massed opponents who might be surrounding you um, at close range, charging in regardless of the risk, I think crossbows are a particularly bad choice. Bows are better. High rate of fire. Pepper them with arrows. Okay, and even within bows, I think not particularly high draw weights. Okay, you're wanting most of the time actually to have the fastest rate of fire that you possibly can do. As we actually see in the Peter Jackson films with the elves, you're really looking about getting as many arrows into the enemy as possible. Machine gun tactics, essentially. Um, so what you're looking to do, if we liken it to the real world, is you're looking to stop that banzai charge essentially because that's what we're going to be expecting of um, goblins and orcs predominantly. Now uh, the other point that we come to if we come back to hand weapons because even if you're using bows at some point hand to hand combat is going to happen especially with a more numerous foe is the nature of the hand weapons that you use. So whether we're using um, single weapons by themselves you know a, a big two-handed weapon uh, like a Zweihander or a, a Dane axe or if we're using one-handed weapons um, like arming swords or maces or axes. There is a question here again, it becomes rate of fire. So if we're dealing against multiple opponents, something that's really important is speed and stamina. If you're having to fight against multiple opponents from different directions the whole time, yes, there is a virtue to having one hit, one kill. Uh, so a heavy, more cumbersome weapon can be uh, beneficial in, in that regard. But remember that a weapon that is heavier and slower, not only is it gonna tire you out quicker, but it's gonna make it more likely that whilst hitting this person, that person over there manages to get a swing in that you don't have time to defend or hit them. Um, and so from that perspective, lighter, quicker weapons might be beneficial. So and then, then if we extract that to two-handed weapons and we come back to the Danax for a second, there is a lot of virtue to if you are having a long-reaching and powerful weapon, making it as light as possible so that you can deal with those multiple attackers. I personally think that within Peter Jackson's vision of the Tolkien-esque world, uh, something like a poleaxe would have very little purpose in most combat against typical foes that you're going to meet, at least within that period of time in their history, so orcs and goblins, because it's a relatively slow, relatively short reaching because of the way that you tend to hold the poleaxe. You tend not to hold it at the end like a Dane axe um, or a spear or quarterstaff. You tend to hold it near the middle and use both ends. So yes, you do have both ends, but it's a short range, relatively heavy, relatively cumbersome weapon that's primarily designed for defeating armor. In this situation, you're dealing with multiple relatively unarmored opponents. The only exception would be Urukai and trolls, okay? So if we're now dealing with opponents who are, you know, giants, various types of troll, cave troll, rock troll, whatever, Urukai, who are really, really robust, that changes the game somewhat. And it also makes it more complicated because if you know that you're now facing uh, massed goblins and orcs, but there are also going to be some trolls and urukai as well. What do you do? Because the goblins and the orcs, well, you might think, I want uh, really quick light weapons that can occupy many people at the same time uh, and also cover against missile weapons. So against them, you might go, my, IT, my ideal armament is going to be sword and buckler or sword and shield, and I can occupy lots of them at the same time, uh, do lots and lots of cuts and thrusts wherever I want against different opponents while covering different lines at the same time and potentially knocking aside a thrown spear and I can do all of this really really quickly 
but now there's a cave troll in front of me. And against the cave troll, what I really want is, you know, maybe a, a, a big ass boar spear, for example. That'd be a pretty good weapon against the cave troll, wouldn't it? Until that one stab doesn't kill it. Uh, but, you know, actually, ironically, then we come back to the poleaxe. Actually, the poleaxe would be a great weapon against the cave troll. Because not only does it have some of the benefits of a boar spear in stopping power thrusting and the ability to reach when you want to, but also, if you do have to come in close, you've got an enormous amount of cleaving power. So it's difficult. <laughs> I think to conclude that in this particular environment, in Peter Jackson's interpretation of the Tolkien-esque world, or indeed what looks to be like the, um, the Amazon Prime series that's coming out soon, their interpretation of Tolkien's world, which seems to be heavily influenced by Jackson's, so it's late medieval, but you're dealing with foes, some of whom are small, not that tough, but extremely numerous. But a lot of your other foes are going to be massive and extremely robust. What do you do when you've got such a diverse range of opponents? And I think multiple weapons is the answer. So by and large, I think you'd see a lot of people wearing a decent amount of armour. I think armour is incredibly important. You'd wear a, almost as much armour as you can wear that doesn't encumber you too much for the situation. Secondly, I think you would definitely see large weapons, particularly pole arms. So we're talking about pole axe type things, Dane axe type things, um, spears, boar spears, halberds, Zweihanders, things like this. Absolutely, you're going to see those as primary weapons. Archers are going to pr prefer bows to crossbows and they're going to use them in very high rate of fire in the highest draw weights that they can manage and still have a good rate of fire. So similar to Hundred Years War and Wars of the Roses longbow tactics I would say uh, or even Mongolian or uh, Manchu archers as well who were dealing with the same things. They have to overcome armour but they also want a good rate of fire. Um, and in terms of hand weapons, yes aside from the pole arms I think you're going to have to have for dealing with those sneaky little goblins in huge numbers something like sword and buckler, sword and shield paired swords, sword and dagger, um, weapons that are quick and nimble that you can wear as backup sidearms. They're quick to deploy and you can occupy two directions at least at the same time with them and fight against multiple opponents. Anyway, maybe you've got completely different opinions on this. What are your ideas and thoughts? How do you think that weapons and armour would evolve in a fantasy environment where many of your opponents are not very big but super numerous and not armoured and some of your opponents are really big and really tough and you have to prepare for fighting both of those at the drop of a hat and at any moment and they might be mixed together as well. So I think it's difficult and very challenging and very different to the historical reality because remember in historical reality humans pretty much only fought other humans and horses you could say as well. But fundamentally the weapons that evolved in our history, which they copy in fantasy environments, the weapons that evolved in our history are basically just for killing other humans and very often you'll find they're quite inadequate for fighting against something like a troll. Looking forward to seeing your comments and thoughts below this video. Uh, please uh, share it around, subscribe if you haven't done already, give us a thumbs up, give us a like and I hope I'll see you back on the channel again really soon. Cheers folks!